Hi everybody. So in the previous video, we talked about reinforcement learning and introduced the general paradigm and the problems that we have with sparse reward settings. Now in this video, I want to dive a little bit deeper into some more technical work that tries to solve this problem of the sparse reward setting. So I hope you'll remember from the previous video that the thing that makes reinforcement learning so difficult is that we're dealing with sparse rewards, which means that for every input frame, we don't actually know the target label that our network should produce. And therefore our agent needs to learn from very sparse feedback and sort of figure out by itself what action sequences led to the eventual reward. And one particular solution that has been emerging from research is to augment the sparse extrinsic reward signal that is coming from the environment by additional dense reward signals that need to aid the learning of the agent. And so in particular in this video, I want to dive into some interesting technical work that introduces ideas like additional reward signals, uh, curiosity driven exploration and hindsight experience replay. Are you ready for a technical deep dive into state of the art reinforcement learning? My name is Xander and welcome to Archive Insights. So in order to solve some of the most challenging problems in reinforcement learning, we have seen the emergence of a wide range of new ideas in reinforcement learning research. And one particular trend that has been very popular recently is to augment the sparse extrinsic reward signal that is coming from the game environment by additional feedback signals that need to help the learning of your agent. And many of these new ideas can be seen as variations of the same general concept. So instead of having a very sparse reward signal that your, your agent occasionally sees, we want to design additional feedback signals that are very dense. So in a sense, we want to create a supervised setting and the goal of those additional rewards, those additional feedback signals is that they are in some way related to the task that we want our agent to solve. So we want to create these dense feedback signals that whenever our agent succeeds in those tasks, it's probably also going to get knowledge or feature extractors that can be useful in the eventual task, the sparse task that we really care about. And so obviously there's no way that I can give you guys a complete overview of all the super interesting research that's going on out there. But I tried to sketch a few very interesting papers that try to give you an idea of the general directions that we're seeing in research right now. So let's start with auxiliary losses. So in most reinforcement learning settings, our agent is presented with some kind of raw input data, like sequences of images, for example. The agent will then apply some kind of a feature extraction pipeline in order to extract the useful information from those raw input images. And then it will have a policy network that uses those extracted features in order to perform a task that we wanted to learn. Now, the problem in reinforcement learning is that our feedback signal can be so sparse that the agent never succeeds in extracting useful features from the input frames. And so one successful approach in this case is to add additional learning goals to our agent that leverage the strengths of supervised learning to come up with very useful feature extractors on those images. So let's take a look at one specific paper from Google DeepMind called Reinforcement Learning with Unsupervised Auxiliary Tasks. So here the standard sparse reward signal is that our agent is walking around in this 3D maze and it needs to find specific objects. And whenever it encounters one of those objects, it gets a reward, right? But what they do is that instead of having this very sparse feedback signal, they also augment the whole training process with three additional reward signals. So first the agent learns to do what they call pixel control. So given a frame from the environment, it uses the main feature extraction pipeline and it learns a separate policy to maximally change the pixel intensities in some parts of the input images. So for example, it could learn that by looking up at the sky, for example, this completely changes all the pixel values in the input scene. And in their suggested implementation, the input frame is divided into a small number of grids and a visual change score is computed for each grid. The policy is then trained to maximize the total visual change in all the grids. And the idea here is that this will force the feature extractor to become sensitive to the general dynamics in the game environment. The second auxiliary task is called reward prediction. And so in this case, the agent is given three recent frames from uh, the episode sequence, and it's tasked to predict the reward that it will get in the next step. So again, we are adding an additional learning goal to our agent that is only used to optimize the feature extraction pipeline in a way that we think is generally useful for the eventual goal that we care about. 
And then there is one final task called value function replay, which basically tries to estimate the value of being in a current state by predicting the total future reward that the agent is going to get from this point onwards. So this is basically what any off policy algorithm like DQN, for example, is doing all the time. And so it turns out that by adding these relatively simple additional goals to our training pipeline, we can significantly increase the sample efficiency of our learning agents. And especially the addition of the pixel control tasks seems to work really, really well in three-dimensional environments where learning to control your gaze direction and how this influences your own visual input signals is very crucial for learning any kind of useful behavior. All right, now the second thing I want to look at is something called curiosity-driven exploration. And the general idea here is that you want to somehow incentivize your agent to learn about new things that it discovers in its environment. So in most default reinforcement learning algorithms, people use what we call epsilon greedy exploration. And this means that in most cases, your agent is going to, just going to select the best possible move based on its current policy, but with a small probability of epsilon, it's going to take a random action. And then this epsilon starts out at 100% in the beginning of training, so it's completely doing random things. And as you train, as you keep progressing, it's actually going to start declining this epsilon value until in the end you completely follow your policy. And the idea is that by doing these random actions, your agent is going to learn to explore the environment. And now the general idea behind curiosity-driven exploration is that in many cases an agent can quickly learn some type of very simple uh, behavior that earns a recurring low amount of reward. But if the environment is hard to explore, a simple agent using epsilon greedy exploration will never completely explore the full environment in search of better policies. And the idea is then to create an additional reward signal that incentivizes the agent to explore unseen regions in the state space. And so a standard way to do this in reinforcement learning is with what we call a forward model. So this means that your agent is going to see a specific input frame. It's going to use some kind of a feature extractor to encode that input uh, data into some kind of a latent representation. And then you have a forward model that tries to predict that same latent representation for the next frame in the environment. So basically it's gonna try and learn the dynamics of its environment based on what I'm seeing now, what is going to happen next, right? And so the assumption is then that if your agent is in a place where it's been many times before, these prediction losses, these predictions will be very good. But if it's encountering a totally new situation it has never seen before, then its forward model will probably not be that accurate. And then the idea is that you can use these prediction errors as an additional feedback signal uh, on top of the sparse reward to you know, incentivize your agent to explore unseen regions of the state space. And so one particular paper that I want to highlight here uses what the authors introduce as an intrinsic curiosity module. And it uses a very good example to show what this all means. So imagine a scenario where an agent is observing the movement of tree leaves in a breeze. Now, since it's really hard to exactly model the breeze, predicting pixel changes for each leaf is going to be virtually impossible. And this means that the prediction error in pixel space will always remain high and the agent will be forever curious about the leaves. You move, Chief. And the underlying problem here is that the agent is not aware that there are some parts of the environment that it simply cannot control or predict. Okay, so here is what the intrinsic curiosity model in the paper looks like. Um, the raw environment states S and S plus 1 are first encoded into feature space using a single shared encoder network. Next, there are two models. You have the forward model, which tries to predict the features for the next state using the chosen action from the policy. And you have the inverse model that tries to predict what action was taken to go from state S to the next feature state S plus 1. And finally, the feature encoding of S plus 1 is compared with the predicted feature encoding of S plus 1 given by the forward model. And the difference, which we could call you know, the agent's surprise about what happened, is added to the reward signal for training the agent. And so going back to our example of the tree leaves, since the motion of those leaves cannot be controlled by actions of the agent, there is no incentive for the feature encoders to actually model the behavior of those tree leaves because in the inverse model, those features will never be useful for actually predicting the action that the agent took. And therefore, the resulting features from our extraction pipeline will be completely unaffected by irrelevant aspects of our environment and we will get a much more robust exploration strategy. 
So in the paper, they benchmark their uh, method using uh, maze exploration. So you have a very complicated maze with a target position and your agent needs to navigate around the maze to find that goal. And you can see that as they increase the size of the maze, so the complexity of that maze, uh, all the methods that do not use uh, intrinsic exploration methods kind of fail if the maze gets too big. But you, if you incentivize your agent to explore unseen regions, then it's much more likely that it's going to eventually find uh, the reward. And so I think this is a really clever idea that instead of just thinking about, okay, I want to get to this goal position, I want to get this reward, your agent should also, you know, it has to be curious about the world. It needs to explore things that it doesn't know about in order to, you know, increase its general knowledge of the environment. So really cool idea. And again, this is just one paper working in this area, but I think a lot of people are realizing that getting your agent to efficiently and intrinsically explore your environment is a very crucial part of learning. All right. Um, another very beautiful extension to the standard uh, reward setting is a recent paper from OpenAI called Hindsight Experience Replay, or in short, HER. And the idea behind HER is very, very simple, but very, very effective. So in a sense, I'm a really big fan of the paper because of the simplicity of the idea. So you imagine you want to train a robotic arm to push an object on a table to a specific target location. The problem again is that if you do this by random exploration, it's very, very unlikely that you're going to get a lot of rewards and so it's going to become very difficult to train this policy. And so the general solution to do this would be to shape a dense reward, which is for example the distance of the object to the target location in Euclidean space, right? So that way you have a very, very specific dense reward for every single frame and you can use simple gradient descent to train this. Now the problem is again, as we've seen, that reward shaping is not actually the solution that we want to use. We would like to do this with a simple sparse reward, you know, success or no success. And so the general idea behind hindsight experience replay is that they want to learn from all episodes, even if an episode was not successful for the actual task that we want to learn. And so hindsight experience replay applies a very clever and very simple trick uh, to get the agent to learn from unsuccessful uh, episodes. So in the beginning of learning, the agent is pushing around an object on the table and it's trying to get to position A. But since the policy is not very good yet, the uh, object ends up at position B, which is not the right thing. This is not what we wanted. So instead of just saying, hey, you did it wrong, you got a reward of zero, what her will do is it will pretend as if going to B was actually the thing you wanted it to do and then telling it, yes, very well done, this is how you move the object to position B. You're basically creating a very dense reward setting uh, from a sparse reward problem. So let's go over the algorithm step by step. So we start off with a normal off-policy reinforcement learning algorithm and a strategy for sampling goal positions, right? We initialize all the parameters that we need and we start playing some episodes. So given a specific goal position, we're just going to use our current policy, we get a trajectory and we get a final position where the object ended up in. So after our episode has finished, we store all those transitions in the replay buffer with the goal that was selected for the policy, but then we also sample a set of modified additional goals and we swap those out in the state transitions and then store everything in the replay buffer. And the really nice thing about this algorithm is that after training, you now have a policy network that can do something different based on the goal that you give it. So if you want to move the object to a new location, you don't have to retrain the whole policy. You can just change the goal vector and your policy will do the right thing. And so in the graph here, the blue curve represents the results from hindsight experience replay when the additional sampled goal was always the final state of the episode sequence, right? So it's the, it's the actual position that the object ended up in after executing a sequence of actions. The red curve, which is even better, represents the results when the additional goals are sampled from future states that are encountered on the same trajectories. And now what I like so much about this paper is that the idea is very simple and the implementation of this algorithm is very simple as well, but it addresses this very fundamental problem in learning, which is that we want to use every single experience that we have as maximally as possible. So in summary, we've just seen a few very different approaches to augmenting sparse reward signals with dense feedback um, that I think hint at some of the first steps towards truly unsupervised learning. But despite the very impressive results that we've seen, uh, there are still a lot of really challenging problems in reinforcement learning. So things like generalization, transfer learning, causality, intuitive physics, I mean, these problems remain as challenging as ever. But I would like to end this video by stating that I think reinforcement learning has tremendous potential. 
If you think about an autonomous uh, robotic assistant in your house, these things might still seem like science fiction today, but I think the reality is that we are currently in the process of solving some of the most fundamental challenges in autonomous learning, much the same way that we had to do in supervised learning when people came up with algorithms like backpropagation or techniques like convolutions, for example. So I think that by looking at the impressive pace of progress over the past few years and the sheer amount of intellectual capacity that is working on these problems, I think breakthroughs could come surprisingly fast. And so obviously the darker side of this very exciting research is that many of the jobs that we have today will be subject to a large degree of automation, an inevitable transition which I think will create a lot of social pressure and inequalities and is probably one of the biggest challenges if we want to create a world where everybody can benefit from the advancement of artificial intelligence. So that was it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you learned something and I'd like to see you again in the next episode of Archive Insights.